my lords, it's a very great pleasure to follow the noble lady Baroness Sherlock and to express my awe at the, uh, to use her phrase, the laser gaze that she applied to the government amendments, which I'm not going to attempt to emulate. So I'll focus on the amendments in this group that aren't in, uh, that aren't government amendments. And I'm going to, for convenience, go through them in numerical order, beginning with the amendment moved by the noble lord, Lord Johnson of Marlborough and the noble lady Baroness Garden of Frognall, uh, 92, which is the noble lord, Lord Adair, um, Abadair noted, um, has some similarities to Amendment 95, which appears in the name of the noble lord, Lord Watson and myself. Um, and somewhat my, to my surprise, I again find myself saying that I agree with a very large amount of what the noble lord, Lord Johnson said, uh, particularly reflections that earnings data cannot be the be-all and end-all of judging the value of qualifications and the Noble Lord's reflections on the value of, of um, creative subjects, uh, reflecting what many other Noble Lords have said in this debate. I would, however, strongly disagree with the Noble Lord's suggestion that uh, lowering the uh, earnings threshold for student loan repayments starting um, is some kind of solution from the current mess that the government is in. The fact is we have generations of particularly, not solely, particularly young people um, who are finding it extremely hard to find a secure economic place in the world and making them more insecure, uh, creating more difficulties very often through those three decades of life when they would normally be expecting uh, to perhaps, you know, maybe settle down, maybe have children, maybe even buy a house um, to put further economic pressure um, would have widespread effects uh, reaching far um, beyond the educational impacts. So I move now to um, amendments 94 uh, and 95 um, in the name of the noble lord, Lord Watson in Bagari and myself. And it is a pity that the noble lord has not yet introduced these. Um, but I think the meaning and the intention of them is, is fairly clear. What we're really doing here is aiming to introduce more flexibility and aiming to acknowledge, as I have said in an earlier group, that we're not in the 20th century where people's lives start by perhaps doing a study of course, doing an apprenticeship, working for 30 or 40 years and then collecting their, their gold carriage clock at the end. But that's not how the world works. People move in many different directions. And I have to say I was rather attracted by the noble Lord, Lord Aberdeer's suggestions of uh, taking up bookbinding. That sounds like a, a rather attractive um, option. But people move in all kinds of different directions in all kinds of ways. And the idea that people can have some kind of linear, progressive, straight line course um, is something that this bill currently mars this bill and that these amendments seek to acknowledge. And I think particularly when you look at 94, the fact is, of course, life happens. Um, people, you know, um, a third to a half of the pregnancies in the UK are unplanned. Um, People never know what life will throw at them, and people need the flexibility of having um, the lifelong learning entitlement to work for whatever life throws at them. Um, that perhaps applies even more to Amendment 96, which we were talking earlier about uh, the possibility of people uh, being able to receive universal credit um, whilst studying um, a, a, along their life course. Well, this is an alternative way of approaching the problem in allowing for maintenance um, grants, or indeed they, those two things might indeed well go together, uh, given the nature and the cost of living these days. Um, in coming to Amendment 97, I feel like I'm picking up a, a subject from which many other noble lords in your Lordship's house are, are vastly more qualified and been working on for a long time. But I think we really have to highlight the utter government failure um, that this clause reflects on and indeed seeks to ensure that it's not extended. Um, it's acknowledged that 9% of the student population currently now, um, and I think, I think that's a, a further education, a higher education figure rather than a further education figure, is 9% is nine but it should be higher. Um, and David Cameron in 2013 promised to provide an alternative student finance off, uh, option to follow with, um, to comply with Sharia law, which prohibits RIBA or interest. The following year, there was a consultation to provide a tackle system that would um, fit within the existing structures. In 2017, the Higher Education and Research Act was granted royal assent, 
and gave the government the power to introduce such a system. And yet we're still waiting. Um, I'd very much value any news that the noble lady the minister might be able to give us on progress in this area. Um, COVID really is no excuse. This is something that's been going on and continuing and an area of failure far, far before um, COVID. And I note that in the other place, there is actually an early day motion calling for the introduction of this form of, of finance for students uh, that's receiving wide, wide support. And finally, um, I don't feel um, on Amendment 99 that I can add anything to the noble Lord, Lord Ayrton, who's so extremely knowledgeable in this area, except to say that, um, uh, and, and indeed to the Amendment 99B here as well, to say, to offer support. Um, and to finally say that this is my last contribution in this section of this committee. Um, I join many others in offering the noble lady, Baroness Penn, the very best wishes for the, for the coming month or two in particular. Um, and I would thank everyone who's contributed uh, to this committee. Uh, we've been a rather small and select band, which seems to be the case with many of the bills before your Lordship's house. And I hope that we might perhaps see a broader level engagement when we get to report stage. But in the meantime, thank you, my Lords.